It's the international crisis that changed the way Americans lived their lives. It's the reason people lined up for miles in front of gas stations, literally fist fighting each other in the streets just for a drop of that sweet, sweet Texas tea. What caused it? How did it change cars forever? You've asked for it a million freaking times. We're finally giving it to you. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the gas crisis. I like cars. You like cars. We like cars. Celebrate your love of cars with a new Jewelry of Cars t-shirt. You get it in an owl, not your owl. Also, vintage black. You get it for the low, low price of $29.98 only at DonutMedia.com. Check it out. It's my favorite shirt to date. This episode's gonna be a little different. There are no sick cars, no heroes, no obvious villains. But this story is just as important Maybe even more important for the history of cars than any story we've ever done before. But before we get into it, hit that like button because uh, it really helps us out with the algorithm. You wanna help us out with the algorithm, don't you? The early 70s were pretty good times for American car companies and the drivers who loved them. Cars were big, V8s were big, gas was cheap, like 36 cents a gallon cheap. So cheap. Everyone had muscle cars and no one gave a shit. It was great. It would have been an awesome time to be alive, but good things don't last forever. And soon there were EPA restrictions in place that sucked the power straight from the muscles. The solution American car companies came up with was simple. Just make the engines bigger, dumbass. So that's what they did, but it didn't really work. All right, this is a 1973 Cadillac Eldorado. It has an eight liter V8, and it takes all eight of those liters to make 235 horsepower, all right? That's like almost three Fagos, and that's a pitiful amount of power. Now, as you can imagine, Detroit's inefficient power creators weren't exactly fuel efficient either, okay? That caddy got eight miles to the gallon. That's one mile per liter. Uh, but because the US still produced a ton of oil at the time and gas was, say it with me again, cheap, it didn't really matter, all right? Until it did. In the 1950s, the government put restrictions on the amount of foreign oil that could be imported into the US. Restrictions that helped promote Texas oil. Thanks, Eisenhower. Think you're cool because you're on a freaking dime? Yeah, right. Not fooling me, pal. By 1970, Uncle Sam's oil fields hit peak production. What does that mean? Well, they produced the most that they ever would, and it was all downhill from there. America's domestic oil supply was in decline. Luckily, there were plenty of other countries that had a bunch of oil and they were more than willing to sell it for cheap. And because of that, Americans didn't notice any difference at all. And oil demand kept climbing and climbing and climbing. Now, thanks to the US's oil price controls, gas prices couldn't go up, which is why that no one really noticed that America's oil supply was already dwindling. The demand just kept rising. And much like my take on Bananas Foster, this was a recipe for disaster. You can't sub beer for brandy. It started with a minor fuel shortage in 1971, then another one in 1972. And that was enough to convince everyone's favorite huge piece of shit, uh, Nixon, that it was time to ditch the oil import quotas put in place by Eisenhower years earlier. Why not import what we need from our buddies in places like Egypt, Syria, Saudi Arabia? They have gobs of oil and they like money. We have gobs of money and we like oil. It's a match made in heaven. The Middle East plus America forever. Things were going great for a while, but then something happened in 1973 that poured sugar in the gas tank of this relationship. And that sugar was the Yom Kippur War. Now to make a long, complicated story short uh, uh, and car focused. The US and some Western European countries came to Israel's aid during the Yom Kippur War. A ceasefire was eventually signed, but the oil producing countries weren't happy 
about which side the Americans chose. They were all members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. You ever heard of it? I'm sure you have. And they decided to band together to teach America and its European cronies a lesson and by setting up an oil embargo to cut off the oil supply. Now this was bad news for people who guzzle gas like a freshman guzzles Natty Light. Now suddenly the massive American cars of the 70s, the cars that people relied on to get to work or go to school or pick up a box of puppies, they were way less practical than before. It was a brutal reality check. People actually had to choose between going to work or picking up a box of puppies. That's a decision that no American should ever have to face. Gas prices went up nearly doubling and the Middle East proved their point. They won the breakup, all right? They're already dating someone else. Europe uh, fared a bit better than the US, probably because uh, they already had a bunch of tiny cars. Now, if your Mini Cooper gets 30 miles to the gallon, going from 250 a gallon to 450 a gallon sucks, but you can deal with it, right? But if you're floating back and forth to work in an eight mile per gallon land yacht with a 27 gallon tank, you are going to feel that price hike. And even if you could afford it, there just literally wasn't enough gas to go around. Now remember 2020, the summer of no toilet paper? Well, that same sort of panic happened. Instead of at the dumps, it was at the pumps. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, there were some pretty sketchy scenes going down around gas stations in 1973. There were lines for gas. Lines went on for multiple blocks. People would wait in them for hours only for the gas station to run dry. There was a lot of yelling and a lot of straight up street fights. Now, just like with the toilet paper in 2020, it was not humanity at its best. OPEC's embargo didn't last for very long. They lifted it in early 1974, but the fresh horrors America experienced at the gas pumps had changed the country. The US government saw how crazy things got when OPEC turned off the taps. To them, going back to chugging gas like nothing ever happened seemed like a national security risk. And to the government's credit, they decided to actually do something about it. They formed CAFE. And no, I'm not talking about a place where open mics live and die. I'm talking about the corporate average fuel economy, something that played a big part in the changes to the American auto industry over the next dozen years. In 1973, the average American car got a whopping 11.9 miles per gallon. Through CAFE, the government mandated that the average had to rise to at least 27.5 miles per gallon by 1985. Seems like a good idea, but American car companies obviously were not stoked. Uh, but still, they figured 10 years. That's a pretty long time, you know? And they had a lot of money, money that had helped sway politicians in the past. And as long as they started to work on making their cars more efficient, making it look like they were doing their best, they wouldn't get in trouble. Plus, they were pretty confident the new standards wouldn't last long. They were wrong, dead wrong. Average fuel economy drifted up from 11.9 miles per gallon in 1973 to 14 miles per gallon in 77. So. You know, baby steps. Uh, as long as another gas crisis didn't come along, everything would be fine, right? But the eyes of the American public had been pried open, much like that scene from A Clockwork Orange when the guy's eyes are pried open. And all of a sudden, their crazy neighbors with those fuel-efficient Datsuns, Volkswagens, and Hondas didn't look so crazy. Well, speaking of Honda, they brought the Civic to the American market at the perfect time, 1972. It was called the CVCC back then, but pretty much everything that has always made the Civic a Civic, great little car, uh, this thing had it. It was practical, it was well built, it was fun to drive and affordable. In the wake of the gas crisis, thousands of Americans had their first experience driving cars like this. And they liked it. They weren't the big rolling couches with gobs of V8 torque that they were used to, but they had their own unique charm. They were nimble, 
zippy, and fun to drive in a different way. They were also much better on gas. Now that's not to say that American car makers didn't build any cars to compete with the Datsuns and the Volkswagens that were already popular in the States. They'd rolled out their versions of these compact fuel sippers a few years before <laughs> with amazing automobiles like the Ford Pinto, the Chevy Vega, and the AMC Gremlin. They were just kind of really crappy. The Ford Pinto was infamous for exploding in rear end collisions, which is obviously not a huge selling point. The Chevy Vega's engine overheated super easily and was plagued with recalls. And the AMC Gremlin, well, it did have a denim interior. So <laughs> that's <f> cool. <laughs> to oversimplify it, Besides denim, the engineering just wasn't there like it was with the foreign competition. So the cars the American companies designed to ward off the rising popularity of import subcompacts ended up making the import subcompacts more popular. So if, for example, Ford had really nailed the Pinto or if it just didn't explode so much, <laughs> American roadways might look a lot different today. Now we're gonna jump to 1979. The phrase gas crisis has mostly faded into memory. OPEC sourced oil is used around the globe and it's pretty cheap. Everything's good. Cars are generally getting better thanks to the widespread adoption of newer tech like fuel injection. American companies are still behind the curve, but with gas prices cheap again, there wasn't a serious fire under their butts like there was in 1973. Things had cooled down and they'd settled back into their road hogging V8 comfort zone. And then something happened to reignite that butt fire. Revolution in Iran! Oil production plummeted, crude oil prices more than doubled, Americans were back to honking, back to yelling in gas lines. They were fighting in the streets. And I'm out of gas, dead out. This second oil crisis wasn't as long and gnarly as the first, but it was a big shit just got real moment for American car companies. They were still taking weak little baby steps, thinking 1985 was a long time away and they had plenty of time to get a handle on the cafe standards, All right? This smaller crisis woke them up. Suddenly, everybody was scrambling to come up with something that could deliver a comfy, powerful American car experience that was also good on gas and didn't explode at all. This was their time to shine, as in punch themselves in the face super hard again and give themselves a shiner, which is what your grandpa called a black eye, all right? Let me give you an example. GM thought that maybe they could use a diesel engine to get better fuel economy, but they didn't want to spend any money actually developing a new diesel engine from the ground up. So they basically converted an Oldsmobile 350 gasoline V8 into a diesel and uh, called it a day. The result was probably the worst engine in GM history. But when it came out, the American public, they were excited. Here is an Oldsmobile Delta 88, a traditional full-size American sedan, and it got 30 miles to the gallon? Sure, they were slow as hell, but guys, they were big, comfy. It's like sitting in our living room. An American. So they sold much better than they should have. Then they started failing in massive numbers. Uh, it was such a huge problem that car historians say the diesel V8 is partially responsible for GM getting rid of Oldsmobile in 2004. Back in Detroit in 1979, the Cadillac guys heard about Oldsmobile's diesel V8 and they were like, hold my steak. They whipped up a V8 that could transform itself into a fuel sipping four cylinder on the freeway. A four cylinder dragging four extra pistons of dead weight around in the engine block. Now, as you can imagine, that didn't work super great either. But to be fair, lots of modern cars use cylinder deactivation to increase gas mileage. But they have the advantage of 40 years of engineering and tech advancement. Now, it's hard to be ahead of your time. <laughs> Believe me, I know. 
Fast forward to now. The American cars of today are leagues better than they were in the 1970s. In fact, they're generally pretty, really good. But if pretty much took the big three, the whole 80s, and a good chunk of the 90s, and a lot of the 2000s to get their crap together. And in the meantime, foreign car companies who already had their game dialed in tight nabbed an increasingly large chunk of the American car sales pie. And it's still going on today. Just last year in 2021, Toyota became the number one selling car brand in America. Now there is no way that that would have happened if not for the gas crisis. Like I said, it changed cars forever. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Up to Speed and everything else on Donut Media. If you like it, uh, let me know, hit that like button. Uh, also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss anything. Get yourself some Donut Merch. I'm really excited about our apparel uh, program. Dropping a new item every week. Go to DonutMedia.com to get in on that. Uh, I love you.